our speaker today, um, which I'm really excited about, is Janine Spees. She is the IR4 Southern Region Field Coordinator at IR4, going to be talking to us about the IR4 project today. So welcome, Janine, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Kayla. And thank you to everyone for um, joining here today and hopefully learning a little bit more about IR4 and um, some of the really great stuff that uh, has, has come out of the program. So I will, with that, go forward. And you guys can see my overview screen. We can. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. So today I just want to talk about what is IR4, um, the programs that we are involved with, who are the participants in the process, what we have done for specialty crops um, in, in working with our, our different stakeholders and partners. Uh, and specifically today I'm going to highlight a um, a blueberry disease control new technology that recently uh, IR4 has been involved with establishing a tolerance and kind of go through step by step what that process was to go from project request to um, approval from EPA for a tolerance for this use. Um, and hopefully from that you learn how to request help from IR4, how to work with us and um, work with us a lot more in the future. So. Okay, the IR4 project stands for Interregional Research Project Number Four. So I don't know what happened to one, two, and three, uh, but four is the Minor Crop Pest Management Program. It was established in 1963 by the USDA in partnership with Stan state land grant universities to help farmers gain legal access to safe and effective pest management products. So. Ultimately, we're here to facilitate registration of sustainable pest management technology for specialty crops and minor uses. What is a specialty crop? Um, it's a lot easier to say what is not a specialty crop. So your um, major crops are crop or corn, soybean, wheat. Um, there's rice is involved with that. So Specialty crops is basically everything else, your fruits, vegetables, nuts, herbs, ornamentals, uh, low acreage, high value crops. Um, IR4 is also you, uh, involved with specialty uses on um, some major crops like rice and sugar cane and peanuts. Uh, if there are certain um, needs that we can help to get registration for, um, uh, an outbreak of an occasional pest or um, there's severe resistance issues for products that are available, things like that. So we are involved with some of those projects. So the need for IR4 comes, there, there's a need for safe and legal uses of pesticides and food crops. So registration of those pesticides is certainly required um, to get that data uh, for registration of a pest control product, there's there's a large investment of resources that goes into that. So uh, the potential sales that a um, company would would get from these smaller specialty crop markets doesn't really justify their investment into um, into getting the data for for registration. So um, that that results in a major void for our specialty crops. Um, that's where we come in to um, fund the research to generate that data that is ultimately submitted to EPA um, and is needed for petition of a pesticide registration. So why does our work matter? Um, as I said, there's um, you know, a, a need for more tools for our spe specialty crop farmers. Uh, pests do not discri discriminate between um, our major crops and our specialty crops. So as we see um, our growers struggle with the limited tools they have available, um, having to preserve that high value crop with, with pest control products, um, you know, we're seeing not only issues with resistance, but we're seeing losses of, of broad spectrum pesticides that that farmers have relied on. Um, so IR4 is committed to finding uh, alternative tools that the growers can have available to them to use um, 
and, and we really focus supporting project requests that are targeted um, for that particular pest or, or pest complex and um, have limited adverse environmental impacts. IR4 is the only publicly funded program that conducts research and submits petitions to the US EPA for approval of, of registration of pest control products. Uh, this, I'll be remiss in, in not mentioning that this is our 60th year of celebrating IR4 since um, our uh, creation um, in that partnership between USDA NIFA and State Land Grant University. So since that inception, uh, over 23,000 pest product registrations have uh, been secured for food crops through EPA, and, and that doesn't even um, include the work that's gone towards um, labels for our horticulture crops, ornamentals, and, and um, greenhouse. So I'll talk a little bit more about that program. IR4 is technology neutral. So we are supporting um, conventional products as well as um, generating data for biopesticides and um, really giving tools to our conventional and organic growers for pest control management. The success of IR4 is, is due in huge part to the network of participants in the process that, that we have built over these 60 years. So um, the, the needs are coming from the public sector. The, the prioritization processes that we do, our project requests that we nominate and then decide if we'll do give funding towards those are coming from um, growers, commodity group liaisons, the researchers and extension uh, faculty that we work with, as well as the IPM centers, having a, a strong relationship with them and seeing where the pest management needs are, where do we need solutions. Uh, those relationships are extremely important to our success. Um, and another important uh, part to our success is our relationships that we have with the um, pest uh, protectant industry, our, our, our manufacturers and registrants of pest control products. So um, once we receive that request, we work with them to determine if that is a use that they would support. Uh, and, um, you know, once that registration and tolerance is established by EPA and that's approved, are they going to put uh, a crop or or pests on the label for the grower to use. So that's really important that we have a good relationship with them. Uh, we also work with uh, commodity group liaisons and other advocates that um, meet with policymakers and regulators to go to bat for, for our growers and, and really um, highlight the need of this program and this work to get them solutions. And then ultimately our relationship with EPA to um, give them the, the data that's generated by our researchers uh, that is, is conducted under good laboratory practices as, as mandated by EPA to um, establish these tolerances. And again, I just wanna highlight the important role of um, our Commodity Liaison Committee. Uh, these are a group of stakeholders that are working very intimately with the farmers. They know what their struggles and needs are, and they're taking time to work very closely with IR4 and show up in Washington on our behalf and, and work with legislators to um, stress the importance of this program and, and get us the funding we need to, to do this research. So they're really critical uh, all the way from greenhouse industry to uh, Florida Fruit and Veg Association, the um, Hops Growers Mint Council, uh, all across the country. These are a really important group of growers and we are always eager to expand that network uh, for anyone who's interested. But to go back to our the relationship we have with EPA and how they're involved with this process, just a, a very brief overview of what they're doing with this data. So they, EPA sets pesticide res residue tolerances on harvested crops. These are the maximum residue levels, um, MRLs that would be allowable 
on these crops um, that they have determined through risk assessment analysis would be safe. So proceeding, receiving this data, EPA is, is conducting a ton of research and, re and pouring a lot of resources into determining the efficacy of these products, the environmental impacts, threat to human health. So even before we get to, you know, get moving forward with this research, we get uh, a stoplight analysis from EPA um, based on the research they've conducted to say, uh, you have a green, uh, you know, strong pathway towards registration if you continue with this work versus uh, there's some, you know, regulation issues with this product. Maybe you don't want to move forward with this project right now. So that that's really important. Um, and, and allowing us to streamline this process and, and get uses in our hands, uh, in the hands of the farmers um, in, in as quick amount of time as possible uh, through the safe pathways that, that we've described. We represent stakeholders throughout the country. So uh, our headquarters, our four headquarters is at NC State University in, in Raleigh. And um, we have four kind of satellite representative um, regional uh, representation um, depicted here in this uh, map. The green is Northeast region. Blue is north central region, gray is western region, and orange is, is southern region. That makes sense. And throughout, we also have uh, USDA ARS centers um, and analytical labs that we work with as well that, that um, we partner with. Uh, this is just a sap snapshot of what's happening in the southern region. We are uh, our, our um, Regional hub is at the Food and Environmental Toxicology Lab in Gainesville, University of Florida. We have our field office. We also have an analytical lab, as well as a quality assurance unit. The quality assurance unit is responsible for reviewing all the data that's been generated um, and conducted under good laboratory practices, making sure um, you know there's no missing information, everything makes sense, um, and that we feel confident submitting that data to EPA that that will be restructable uh, you know reconstructed repeatable um, reliable research that we're submitting so they're an important part of the team and these are um, the, the red dots here are our, our GLP uh, good laboratory practices residue field centers um, that are conducting a lot of this research so we have one at um, headquarters, NC State University, two in uh, Florida at um, Citra and Homestead, and one in Texas, A&M, and another in, at University of Puerto Rico. So we have a, a pretty good uh, range, and we work with researchers throughout this region, over 40 researchers every year we're, we're, we're collaborating with to conduct uh, research trials for um, efficacy and performance. I'll talk a little bit more about our programs now. Um, we can kind of divide those into two main program areas, our food crops and environmental horticulture. So I'm gonna go through um, briefly what those different programs entail. Our food use program, that's really where we use a lot of our um, USDA NIFA dollars and funding to conduct research. So as I said, um, we mostly have magnitude of residue or MOR residue trials that we're conducting under good laboratory practices um, as required by EPA. These are the trials that we're conducting to um, you know, have a protocol to conduct these trials in the field, collect fruit samples um, to submit to our analytical labs. Um, and the data is compiled by a study director that ultimately will prepare that um, petition to submit to the EPA for consideration of, of registration and um, establishing a tolerance. And EPA will conduct a risk assessment to determine that. So as I said, we're really focusing our efforts on projects that have clear pathways to registration. So we can really be good stewards of this money and making sure we're getting um, 
solutions into our growers hands as soon as we can. On the other side of residue, we have product performance. So this is non-GLP, um, kind of more your standard efficacy, pesticide screening research that you, you might be more used to. And we're looking at not only efficacy of a, of a product or either an herbicide, a fungicide, or a, a insecticide, miticide, nematicide, uh, but also crop safety on uh, that particular crop you're using. So obviously that's very important information for um, a registrant, a, a, a chemical company to know that um, if it works great, but it also can't burn the crop <laughs> that the farmer's growing or they're gonna be pretty mad about that. So that's important work for, for us to um, conduct as well. And it can be helpful to add new invasive pests to a label that might already exist that, um, let's say there's a new invasive thrips uh, for for blueberries um, and one product is registered, but there's no thrips on the label. We can um, potentially help in our communications with a company to say, this is a need. Here's some data. Is there any more needed? And would you support adding this use to your label? So um, that that's the kind of work that we're doing there. Uh, just a snapshot of what was completed uh, from 2022. This is from our annual report. Um, we conducted, we prioritized 47 residue studies and 41 product performance projects, as well as 28 integrated solutions projects, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in the next slide. Uh, overall, 13 um, registration petitions were submitted to the EPA. And at the, by the end of 2022, we had 694 new tolerances established for those 13 active ingredients. So we're able to accomplish that through um, crop groupings and being able to do research on representative crops that um, will cover uses for a lot of other crops that are, that are included in that crop group. So um, that might be very important for some of, I guess they're not orphan crops, but, but maybe, um, crops that a registrant certainly wouldn't find very um, lucrative to include on a label, but since it is, you know, a rep crop might be like canola um, or, or uh, rapeseed would cover um, carinata and, and um, sesame and some of these other crops that we're seeing are, are becoming more and more attractive to growers. And so it's really important that we, um, establish uses that can that can include those as well when possible. Um, so integrated solutions. This is something that has morphed from our biopesticide organic support program of a few years ago, um, really using a lot of those same principles and, and protocols, but um, maybe encompassing a more um, whole scale management of pest problems in, in uh, a farmer's production system. So we're really striving to identify pest problems and solutions. A lot of the time these projects precede what we're gonna move towards a residue project. So um, screening multiple potential products, seeing what works, what's working best. And you know once that, data is, is demonstrated by the researchers we work with coming to a consensus of, okay, we're going to put our resources towards putting, pushing this product to registration and getting this, um, you know, this seems to be the clearest pathway towards um, getting a product in, in farmers' hands. So um, we're evaluating uh, not only conventional products, but uh, biopesticides and some other um, emerging technologies like um, NPVs. Um, we did we did some work with uh, that with corn earworm um, steam control for for weed management. Um, there, there's a lot of, of good examples that uh, of some of the newer technology that we're involved with. So um, our integrated solutions is including only products that are not currently registered. They are, you know, in a, in a commercially 
uh, available product, they're they're in that that stage. So it's not in the beginning stages being tested in a lab, but there is a, a commercial product available, but it has not been, um, or, or there's a there's a tangible product available, but it's not commercially available to growers. Um, and those we're looking at pest problems without solutions. Uh, resistance management, residue mitigation, as well as for organic food production. Excuse me. We have a very good team of, of scientists that are very involved with biopesticide regulatory support. Uh, this is obviously a very um, fastly growing um, segment of the pesticide industry and more and more and more seeing newer companies coming to IR4 to ask for help with registering new products. So um, IR4 provides that service to them, guiding them through the um, process with EPA of registering new products. Uh, I believe Philip Moore with IR4 would, would know a lot more about that and he's been um, involved with some of those projects. International involvement is um, some, another important aspect of our partnerships that we've relied on to be successful. And it's really important for harmonizing our um, maximum residue levels of crops going from being um, exported from the US and helping our industry um, and making sure those standards for um, pesticide tolerances are, are being um, you know, equal and, and recognized throughout the country, throughout the world. So um, one of those partnerships we have is with Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada. Uh, a lot of the time we will cooperate um, on projects together to combine our resources, or we can share data that helps us um, achieve tolerance registrations, um, sooner than if we IR4 had to do all the work ourselves. Um, so that, that's that been a really fantastic relationship and, and we really value that um, involvement with them. And they're just really great to work with. Uh, and we also have a, a relationship with what's called my, the Minor Use Foundation. And they are really working with researchers throughout the world um, to uh, generate data towards towards establishing these tolerances on specialty food crops. So um, in in some crops where we might not have um, a lot of capacity within the U.S., we can partner with them to um, work with researchers around the world who, who might have the ability to do some of that work as well. So there's um, a link to our website and that program to learn more about that. And then I'm just going to talk very briefly about environmental horticulture program, but it is a good program um, that is assisting with um, developing pest management tools for use on ornamental plants. Now, because this is not an edible food crop, it's not um, as rigorous as the um, registrations that, that we have to go through for food crops, but um, it is very, really, very heavily involved with efficacy and crop safety. Obviously, crop safety on uh, an ornamental crop that, that is such a high value production is important. So we're involved with a lot of the researchers doing that work, supporting them in their work, and um, funneling that data that's generated to the manufacturers so they can determine um, whether they can add that that. Uh, crop to the label. This is uh, a look at the research cycle. I, I mentioned this because we do have a workshop coming up this October um, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, it works on a two-year basis where um, starting in October we're going to meet and through discussions we are going to um, talk about what are our highest pest management needs. There's a survey that goes out to um, the industry, uh, the, the, the stakeholders in greenhouse and nursery industry to, to figure out what those are. And um, we, we come together to determine what we're going to put um, our funds towards. And then every year around November, you can submit your 
project requests that you would like to be involved with. And the environmental horticulture manager will decide where that funding is being distributed and, and work on the protocols. So that's kind of the, the cycle on that, which differs a little bit from the food use side. Um, and we meet every year and, and conduct this prioritization process first at the regional level. Um, so for the Southern region, we will have our priority setting uh, for three days in June that'll be divided by discipline. We're meeting virtually this year. We try to do every other year in person. Um, so we were in Atlanta last year and um, we, uh, receive project requests from stakeholders, researchers, or commodity groups, and we review those um, requests with the manufacturer, EPA, R4 management to determine if they are researchable. Um, the requests are then prioritized during at the regional level and then on a national level at our food use workshop, which will be in September in Raleigh at headquarters. So um, after the workshop, we decide what we're funding that year, that following year, and we um, do trial assignments at our national research planning meeting and determine how that funding will be distributed for the next year. The field work is conducted. If it's a residue project, then that um, those samples will be shipped to the lab for analysis either within the IR4 program or we do work with contract labs as well to get that work done. And the study director will compile all that research um, after multiple um, audits, quality assurance audits, sometimes EPA audits um, during the process. And then uh, that package is submitted to EPA. So that's from the selection of a project to submitting package that data package to EPA is about 24 to 36 months on average. Um, with COVID, that kind of got knocked back a little bit, but we're hoping to get back there. And then once that package is with EPA, um, it's about a one to one and a half year process. Again, that's been pushed back a little bit with COVID, but for them to conduct their risk assessment analysis and determine if they'll approve um, that use and establish a tolerance. And then uh, it is up to the manufacturer to determine if they will move forward with adding that crop or pest to their label, uh, which they usually always do, um, usually do uh, because we have such a strong relationship with them and work with them throughout the process to, to make sure that they're on board with it. So for the rest of this um, talk, I want to highlight a, a specific um, instance of a, a success story of establishing a tolerance and kind of go step by step of how that was that was a, that was done from the very beginning. So um, in 2017, we received this project request for sulfur dioxide on blueberries for post-harvest control on um, botrytis. And I am just going to admit, I'm an entomologist, so I'm a little out of my scope. I'm supposed to represent all the disciplines, but I'm going to do my best to um, talk about why this was an important need and, and the process that was involved with this research, because it's very interesting, but very complex. Um, but basically, um, this need comes from California, actually, even though we certainly grow some great blueberries in the southern region, um, the need for this particular one came from California. This is uh, a, an ever-increasing um, industry throughout the world, but in California, they've really seen increases and um, they do have a, a large export market. Um, so that uh, post-harvest control for blueberries in that instance is very important. Uh, blueberries can last up to four to six weeks in, in storage, but um, the risk of developing these diseases and as well as moisture control is really a big issue. Um, so um, the request was um, expressed by the um, commodity industry, Nature Right Farms in this, in this instance and supported by researchers at UC Davis. And they had um, some, some efficacy data to share. Uh, they argued that this was a really cost-effective um, technology 
and as I said, important for export markets. So once we received that project request, um, it was given a, a PR number, project request number, as you can see up there. And that is um, what we sent to the manufacturer. In this case, it was Snowden Enterprises. They came back to say they support this use. Um, so we in our database indicate that it is a um, researchable project. Uh, in this case, they said that residue data was needed. Um, they had uh, efficacy and, and crop safety data to show that it was okay to move forward with the with the residue. And we also got a risk assessment um, from EPA, their stoplight risk assessment green, it's good to go. So this should have a clear pathway forward. We also had really strong support from commodity groups, the uh, U.S. High, Bl High Bush Blueberry Council, California Blueberry Commission, as well as Washington Blueberry Commission. So um, I was not here in 2017 at the workshop, but I could imagine there were people from those councils at that workshop saying, this is a strong need for us. We want to see this um, selected for funding in 2018. So um, it did. It was um, nominated and it was uh, added to our research plan in 2018. Trials were conducted at uh, the Kearney Agricultural Research and Extension Center by Field Research Director David Ennis, who, if you're with IR4, is basically the star uh, field research director. He can do anything. He can make anything happen. If David Ennis can do it, no one can. So um, this was a really good project for him to take on because it was really complicated, as we'll see as we walk through. Um, <clears throat> so between that relationship with our ag research and extension centers, as well as a strong presence of USDA ARS in that area, um, they were able to, to con conduct some pretty um, complicated research. So that's a really important um, partnership that the IR4 relies on to, to get this work done. Uh, once these field trials are assigned, um, a study director uh, is is assigned to this project. They will draft the protocol. They communicate with the manufacturer as well as the researchers conducting it to um, make sure everyone is in agreement to finalize the protocol. And then a very detailed protocol, I'm talking like 22 pages long, uh, is, is um, provided to the researcher and that details all the things that need to be collected in order for this to be done under good laboratory practices. So this is just a shot of what those um, treatments for this particular project entailed. Um, usually we have an untreated uh, and a treated control. Sometimes there's two treatments. Uh, in this case, they were looking at sulfur dioxide gas with the sulfur dioxide um, releasing pads, um, I forget, liner pads, I think what they were called, um, and then kind of a combination of these to show if if there were multiple treatments of sulfur dioxide. In this case, they're looking, they're measuring the sulfites from this treatment. Um, how, how what, what is the worst case scenario of how much residue could be found on this blueberry? So we can know um, are we still within that limit of being uh, an uh, acceptable level uh, of sulfites for, for this? And EPA will, um, <clears throat> will reference the work that they've done already with that, with that compound. So just to, to show a little bit more about what was involved with this, I got these pictures from David. He had to go back in his, his archives of what he did. I don't know if he wants to remember this research or not, but it was, it looked pretty interesting um, of buying the packaged blueberries, um, or he might have collected them in the field and put them in clamshells. I'm not really sure which um, um, would be done, but probably collected from the field, put in clamshells, and um, there was a treatment within uh, a, a concealed container which was in a which was in a, a separate um, cold room um, that that this work was all conducted under safe um, safe conditions but they had the actual sulfur dioxide gas they had these um, pads that they were looking at um, and you know they're 
very specifically determining how much product is being um, released into uh, and, and treated onto these blueberries. So they have um, calibrations that they have to do. They have to check those calibrations. Um, there's lots of checks and balances in how this data is, is generated. And again, just some examples of the different, um, you know, blueberries in clamshells and boxes, blueberries in um, the lugs, um, just different scenarios to encompass all the different ways we could see this happening in the field. As you can see, so these are this is an example of the samples that need to be collected. Um, we usually do two samples per treatment, um, depending on what the crop is. There'll be a minimum sample size that you need to hit: one pounds, two pounds, four pounds, um, so that the analytical lab can have enough sample to to work with. So um, yeah, there were a lot of berries shipped to the lab. I think in this case, it was a, a, a contract research uh, lab that worked with a contract analytical lab. Uh, this is what the request looks like in our database. Um, there's a lot of information here, and we try to keep track of the process as it goes from um, project request submission to what was discussed at our workshops, what are the needs that were expressed initially by the requester to what the manufacturer wants. And it's just, you know, builds a, a narrative um, that, that we can keep track of where we originally were trying to get hold of. But I just want to show the timeline here with this. So the bottom are the trials that were conducted um, in 2018. The lab received the samples um, and completed analysis by the end of 2019. Um, the QA reviewed the field data, um, raw data, as well as the lab data that was generated from all of this. The study director compiled this in a petition and submitted this at the end of 2020 to EPA. And by the end of 2022, there was a um, ruling from EPA that a tolerance was established. Um, so that is... Um, and approved use now for blueberries. And um, the next step is to see that that use is um, labeled for uh, a commercially available product. And um, this is a technology that is available throughout the world um, and, and used in, in other parts of the world. So this was an important step to um, allowing us to legally export our product um, and work with those different countries now that we have a um, tolerance established for sulfites using this technology. So Tessera is a company that we work with that has this um, commercially available technology. I, I know they were about to label the the use for blueberries i don't know if it specifically is yet but it's it's um should be very soon uh and they have expressed interest as as well for raspberries and blackberries this is not a um use that has been a, um, a tolerance that has been established for these crops but it would be a very valuable tool um so this is some of the the efficacy work they shared with us um and they will probably share it again at our upcoming industry technology session that we host every year in July. Uh, this year, it's, it's July 20th. <clears throat> so those slides I just showed you were from the previous industry technology session um, where uh, the red, the company, chemical companies come and talk about what, <clears throat> uh, what are some of the new active ingredients they're working with, what are some uses they would support and, and be supportive of working with IR4 with. So it's a good opportunity for um, you to learn what is some of the new technology that's coming out that, that you could involve, include in your program and um, work with us to submit those requests so that we can um, know of the need and um, support your work. Yeah, so how can you be involved? Tell us what 
are the needs of the growers you're working with and um, what are some potential solutions that they're looking for that they don't have legally available to them. Um, so this is our website. That's a, a URL code that you can kind of hit there to get to the website. Um, and this is a look at when you get to the main page of our website in the top right corner, you'll see a submit a request button and um, that'll take you to this page uh, to submit a request for either food crops, the different programs I talked about earlier, residue and product performance um, versus integrated solutions, kind of screening multiple products uh, or environmental horticulture if there's some biopesticide um, needs that, that you can um, that you know of and can link a interested party to. So there's so much more I could have covered in this talk and, and walking through all the great things that we show on our website. Um, I'm happy to do that at any point one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, there's so much great information there from efficacy data to um, other success stories that we've been involved with. Um, you can actually learn about some more of our ongoing research um, next week, Tuesday, there will be a, a research symposium on a lot of the performance and integrated solution projects that are ongoing. So um, if you go to our website events uh, tab, you can find the link to register. It is free, uh, but please register to attend. So with that, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about IR4, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks so much, Janine. Um, that was really helpful for me to have just more context of, of what you guys do. Um, and we do actually have a, a couple of questions that I'm seeing. There's one in the Q&A, so I'll ask you that one first. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's from Deb in the Northeast um, region. And she says, does IR4 look at practices rather than pesticide applications? Uh, for example, maybe netting do they look at that as well yeah that's a that's a great question thanks for the question deb um in recent years we've definitely been getting more involved with uh, applications of pest control products that might veer from the traditional conventional sp spray um and we're seeing as you see more of a interest from that from the growers perspective you see more and more interest from um industry to invest in those types of products so um there's been some some more talk again like netting we've talked about pesticide netting like treated netting um, but we haven't uh, started a project with that yet because uh, there isn't a lot of support from industry to do that yet, but there's talk of it. Um, and like I said, we're we're getting involved with some more of the, um, you know, steam treatments for weed control, um, the uh, nunoviruses. We've been in, involved with a researcher at University of Kentucky that did some um, uh, in in work with the infected corn earworm um, for, for management in there. So there, there's some work and I'm, I think IR4 is, is interested in expanding on that. Okay, great. Um, another question that we have is from Yop and he is actually at the center of IPM or center for IPM at um, NC State as well. Right, actually right, under IR4 <laughs> okay. in that same building. Um, but Yap is wondering, are there any prospects among integrated solutions in the development to control resistant populations of diamondback moth, specifically in brassicas? That is a good question. Um, and, and I'm sure I could show you. Do I have a second? Could I do that? Sure. Okay, let's do a little tutorial in, uh, in the website. So if you're ever interested in um, looking on what projects there are, you guys, can you see this? Me yeah. Typing? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the ir4project.org. Um, and if you go into our food crops tab, you can 
see a, a lot of these different tabs uh, that are related to that. Um, for integrated solutions, you could go here um, and um, look for, oh, I did, a, let's go to database search options, sorry. There we go. Um, so you could look at integrated solutions requests or integrated solutions funded projects. And those will be combined um, very soon. We're doing some overhaul of how this is organized in the database. So I think it'll be a little bit easier to work with. Um, but if you wanted to look up something like that, Diamondback Moth, uh, is that one word? Um, you can kind of see what has been submitted as requests. What are the status of those projects? Uh, looks like this is a potential project that's been submitted in 2021 from um, California as well as North Carolina. Here's some potential products they listed. Um, yeah, so this is this is a potential project. So I would say if you are interested, um, you can show your support here. Um, support, add your, add your email, right? maybe a reason why you support this, if you would add any potential products to that list. Um, you can see there's some um, biopesticides as well as uh, the trace A dispenser, I guess, is, is one they're looking at in that um, protocol. So it is not prioritized yet, but it could be at our next workshop. So if you would like to see that supported, please participate um, and that's awesome. I had no idea that was on there that you could go in and search. So I think that was really helpful, Janine. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and thank you for the, for the question. Um, yeah, there, there's so much time you could spend to, to, to showing the ins and outs of this. Um, and I don't want to take up any more time, but there's just a lot of information in here that would be useful to everyone. And I know Joe and, and Roger and I have talked to, and, and you, Kayla, have talked about how we can merge ourselves to be just a super center of information. <laughs> right. And the answer is in there somewhere. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of information that's been generated. That's awesome. So we do have, I think, another question. Um, Julius Fiardo from the Office of Pest Management Policy at the USDA is raising his hand. And Julius, I have um, given you permission to speak. If you'd like to ask your question out loud, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, someone questioned about the uh, practices as part of the integrated solutions. Just curious if the use of, say, um, um, targeted delivery system for pesticides or position uh, tools are also included in the integrated solutions. Reason why I ask this is there are some regulatory issues where uh, there could be a rate reduction or a re reduction in the number of applications for a pesticide that is under a registration review, if this is something that IR4 is is being considered or is, or is considered in your integrated solutions. Thank you. Thank you for the, the thought, Julius. Um, that is very interesting uh, to consider. Um, obviously, there's a lot of advancements um, with the technology for precision agriculture. Um, in our last industry session, we heard some of the, the advancements in that technology. I'm sure in our, our next session, we'll hear more about that from the industry. Uh, but that's really interesting to think how that could impact um, the, the um, rates that are actually going out there and, and how that would, how we would be involved with that. So I think that's something great to consider. And hopefully we can talk more about that with with you as the stakeholders and through IR4 in our, in our meetings. Yeah, definitely some great questions coming in. Um, so while people are thinking of maybe more questions for Janine, uh, if it's okay, Janine, I'm gonna go ahead and bring on Roger to, to talk about um, PMSPs and, and a need that we have at the Southern IPM Center, and we'll give time for more people to think about questions. So welcome, Roger, to the call. Roger is one of the co-directors of the Southern IPM Center. And um, yeah, go ahead, Roger. 
Hey, thank you so much, Janine. I think you're doing a great job of demystifying IR4 and making it accessible. And this is truly a great program. I just wanted to let everybody know about a, a opportunity here that um, is kind of a collaborative effort that with IR4, but I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, either a pest management strategic plan or a crop profile. Maybe put your thumbs up or thumbs down. Just be interested to see who's heard. Uh, but basically, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information. These are documents that um, are produced, uh, the crop profiles at the state level, PMSP is a regional effort, but this is an effort uh, to collect information that becomes extremely valuable for, um, for uh, a number of reasons. They can be used to um, justify a, a grant proposal because the PMSP identifies priorities. Uh, priorities for research, education, and regulation. And it's a great way to network with professionals. But just starting with a PMSP, this is a regional document that culminates in a workshop with growers. And we actually bring a, uh, all these people into the room. And we, um, throughout the year, we've been collecting information on all these things you see here from um, worker activities, production practices, IPM practices, uh, pollinated protection, beneficials, biological controls. We basically go through every uh, every single pest that's important, and we find out what's actually happening in the field. And here's the the um, the thing we have not had. Uh, we've had crop profiles that were done in the um, in the 2000s, but we have not had a recent crop profile or a pest management strategic plan uh, done in the South. So this would be a great opportunity. If you're interested in leading one of these, um, gathering your colleagues and actually building one of these documents, we can help you with a lot of the details, with the project flow and potentially with funding. I would love to see us get one of these documents together and that would really um, help us build a stronger, um, a stronger information database and a stronger a sense of what is happening uh, with pest management in Blueberry. So please uh, reach out to me or to, uh, to Kayla uh, if you're interested in doing that or in, indeed leading a PMSP or a crop profile on another uh, another crop. It's a great opportunity to um, to collaborate and get to know both growers and your other uh, professionals in the in the industry. Uh, thank you very much, Kayla, for the opportunity to talk about it. I don't know if anyone has any immediate questions. I'm going to give people a second to think about it, but I'm not seeing any questions right away. Uh, I do want to let folks know that we do have another webinar coming up in May, and this one is on insect pest management strategies and water deficit cotton production systems. So if you are a cotton person or know people um, in that industry, please let them know about that upcoming webinar. It is an ARDP project, so a multi-year project that was focused on this, and that's coming up in May, um, and I'll put the link to where you can register for that into the chat as well. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions, but Janine, I always like to, to ask, if you could leave people with one thought or one thing that you want them to remember about IR4, what would that be? One thing to think about IR4. Um... Or, you know, even if, even if like after they leave this meeting and they're talking to someone about the webinar, what do you want them to remember about IR4? IR4 is here to help. <laughs> um, and, and we have a vast network of people that we work with. So if you have a question or a need for your crop um, and you don't know where to go, you can always go to IR4 and we'll help you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And and you said there was a, another workshop coming up. Um, what's the one that's that's closest that's coming up? Yes, next week, Tuesday, one to four, uh, April eleventh is the uh, IR four research symposium. It's the second year it'll be held. If you go on our website, you can find um, the agenda and um, learn more about what's going to be talked about. But it's with our biological. Um, our lead biologists, um, Aliche Axel, Jamin Patel, and Roger Batson, and they'll be talking about performance and integrated solutions, ongoing research. Perfect. Well, thanks again so much, Janine. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody on this call did. Um, thanks for, <laughs> even though you're an entomologist, really looking into that blueberry study and letting us know <laughs> more about that process. And um, 
I just want to say thanks to IR4 for all the great work that you're doing as well. So thanks so much.